This is George Smart. We recorded this show in June, and just recently I learned that our guest Marty Hilton has a new job. In just a few weeks, starting in January 2023, he'll leave the National Park Service to be president of Architecture Sarasota. Stewarding the legacy of Sarasota's incredible array of modernist buildings, especially houses created by architects such as Paul Rudolph, Carl Abbott, Victor Lundy, Gene Leedy, Tim Siebert, Jack West, Guy Peterson, and many more, you can learn more about Architecture Sarasota at architecturesarasota.org. Hi, I'm Katie Swenson with Mass Design Group, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. The American Institute of Architects, or AIA, is the leading professional association for architects in the United States, and U.S. Modernist Radio was there for their national conference last June in Chicago. The AIA has about 94,000 members, and this was the first in-person conference the National Association has had since COVID. People were thrilled to be back at a conference, and as always, the conference was really well organized. Our George Smart found a sweet spot to record interviews conveniently located between the main Hyatt Hotel and McCormick Place, the convention center. And today you'll hear George's conversations with Jen Mazengarb, architectural historian and executive director of AIA Chicago, Marty Hilton, whose title barely fits on a business card, is the historic architect for climate change at the National Park Service Climate, Science, and Disaster Response Program, and Shannon Battison, president of another AIA, the Australia Institute of Architects. But first, we'll thank the people who make U.S. Modernist Radio possible, Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs, and by modernist realtor Angela Roll. In our ongoing mythology, modernist realtor Angela Roll dated Harry Potter at the age of 17 while she attended Le Corbusier High School just down the road from Hogwarts. They never played each other in soccer, but their proms were legendary, particularly the year they did Stairway to Heaven. Although ridiculed by architecture students for dating a magician, she learned how to conjure up the slightly tipsy ghost of Mies van der Rohe and aced all the exams. She even became class valedictorian. Now she's one of the few real estate agents with formal architecture training, giving practical advice to buyers and sellers, plus she knows what wizards like to eat. Angela Roll is your magic spell for modernism. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or call 919-995-0550. Jen Masongarb of Chicago interned for a local architect in her native Manistee, Michigan, then earned a BA in architecture and a master's in architectural history. She spent three years as a project leader at the Danish Architecture Center in Copenhagen, which is a pretty sweet job, before beginning nearly two decades as curator, lecturer, writer, and educator at the Chicago Architecture Center. If it's been built in Chicago, she knows about it. Now she's executive director of AIA Chicago and tackles issues such as equity, diversity and inclusion, community outreach, green building infrastructure, and community development. And oh, oh yeah, she also coordinated hundreds of volunteers to staff the AIA National Conference in Chicago last summer. And yet, she still found time to sit down for an interview. Here's my conversation with Jen Masongarb. Jen, I'm really happy to meet somebody who's as much into fonts as I am. I'm not an expert at it by any means. I'm just an enthusiast. Nor am I. I'm kind of a hobbyist, really. I am in the same category, George. Of fonts. Fonts is a special area of nerddom. (laughs) Yes. A very special area that exists for people who, uh, you know, get into the obscure things. And it's interesting because in talking to people about fonts, each font 
brings up some kind of special emotion sometimes for people. Like for me, whenever I read something in Comic Sans, you know, it's happy. <laughs> right? Right? Right. It could be your mother died and it'd be okay. <laughs> it's in Comic Sans. That must be fine, right? Do you have any fonts that speak out to you? Oh. My CV is an Avenir. Okay. Avenir, Avenir. I don't yeah. know how you pronounce it. I don't it. know. Uh, again, I'm I'm the hobbyist too. Um, I like it because uh, it's clean, it's simple, it's not as hard and sharp as others. Maybe a little bit softer than Helvetica, more stylish than Ariel. Yes. Sort of clean and I, I'm I'm a big fan of Avenir, so that's what I chose to put my CV in. But yeah, different. You're right. Different fonts speak to us in different ways. I really think, I got to say, I think Comic Sans should really only be used by daycare centers. <laughs> I really think they are the only ones that should be really? allowed to use okay. Comic Sans. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's just daycare centers, preschools. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. And of course, there's Time Robin. That's kind of the grandmother of right? fonts, right? Right, right. right. Mm-hmm. Or something very bureaucratic. Right. Should right. be in Times Roman. Right. So, you know, I, I am a frequent fan of cemeteries. I wander around cemeteries a lot. Yeah. And cemeteries are a great place to look at fonts. And I take pictures of them, and I share them on my Twitter account. Isn't there a cemetery here or somewhere in the Chicago area where there's a tombstone, and it says, I told you I wasn't feeling well? I don't know. Maybe. I think that's around Chicago really? somewhere. I I remember that that's vaguely great. from a Ripley's Believe It or Not that's great. piece. That's so great. That's a great tombstone. That's great, yeah. Now, when you're not chasing fonts, you are running AIA Chicago, and you have a special role in this conference because you and your army <laughs> of volunteers are backing up the national organization to make things happen. So how does that all work? That's right. So we're the local chapter, AIA Chicago, as the host city. I think the role has changed for the host chapter over the years, but I think what AI National has figured out really is what is the host city uniquely suited to do and what is nationally uniquely suited to do. And I think the, the division of labor has, has come to a good place, I think. What the host city is uniquely suited to do is they know the city. They know yeah. the city. They know the architecture. They know the stories to be told. They know the people. So we have three primary things that we're doing here at the conference. 4,000 people are taking a tour in four days. We've got about 1,000 people a day, roughly, taking a tour uh, One with tour us. or multiple tours? <laughs> about 90 tours. Okay. I think 90. that's a big tour to take people on. <laughs> about 90 tours. We divided uh, the tours sort of into two camps. The more historic tours, let's call it the story of Chicago. Mies van der Rohe. Daniel Burnham, Frank Lloyd Wright, Louis Sullivan, that sort of more historic story. We partnered with uh, the Chicago Architecture Center, and their docents do that every day, and they're experts at it. They're volunteers. They're highly, highly trained. I know that because I spent 18 years there tra- helping to train them. Ah, okay. <laughs> but, um, but CAC is uniquely suited to tell that story, Chicago's architectural story and significance and legacy. Um, They're doing about half the tour departures, and then the other half of the 90 or so tours are led by our members here, our AIA members, and it's new construction, new projects, new, could be historic projects, restoration, et cetera, et cetera, but new projects, we'll call it that, and our members are leading those around the city, and so we have this really nice mix of the story of Chicago and then the today, the, yeah. So most of the people I see around here with black shirts and A22. Mm. Are those your folks? No, those are, well, yes, those are our staff okay. and then also nationals staff. National staff. And then the other piece that we have of the puzzle is the host chapter lounge that's on the expo floor. And then the other unique thing, not totally unique, but the way in which we're doing it unique is Friday night, we have a series of open studios where we bundled together three or four firms together, all within about a 20-minute walk of each other, usually a big firm and a small firm, and then maybe a medium-sized firm. Maybe a firm that was... This is the Goldilocks formula? Right, right. Maybe a firm that you've heard of, and maybe a firm that you haven't heard of. 
and uh, you buy a ticket and you get to explore those in any order, stay as long as you want. They'll have drinks and snacks and you get to maybe be surprised by a view, uh, a firm that you haven't heard of, see their work and have those deeper conversations. So we're looking forward to that. That's on Friday night. So the host chapter lounge, the open studios, and then the big thing is the tours. So we've got an army, as you said, yes, an army. We had uh, about eight committees come together over the last six months to plan and develop all of those things made up of our members. And then we have another army of volunteers who are just volunteering in these two, three days, four days. So are you heading for a big vacation next week after this is all over? (laughs) The week of the 4th of July. I'll take some time off. Good, good, good. So... For our listeners who've heard about Chicago and things over the years, what's the difference between A, Chicago, the Chicago Architecture Center, and the Chicago Architecture Foundation? Right. So Chicago is unique in the country because of the fact that the Chicago Architecture Center and AI Chicago are two separate organizations and always have been. In other cities, many times the local chapter started a foundation to be that outreach to the public. Yes. And in Chicago, they grew up independently of each other with different missions from the start. So CAC now is a Chicago Architecture Center, was founded originally as the Chicago Architecture Foundation. Okay. So they're the same thing. Same organization, right? They changed their name in 2018. And they have been dedicated to inspiring the public to understand why design matters. In many other cities, New York, for example, right, the Center for Architecture grew up through the chapter, but that's different here in Chicago. Okay, okay. And the boat tours Mm -hmm. that are in Chicago are Mm -hmm. just world-renowned. Everybody has to go on them. They are. They're fantastic. Yes, yes. So CAC, uh, I know a lot about CAC because I spent many years there. But yeah, two separate organizations. They have an army of about 500 docents who are all volunteers who give their tour. Very well-trained, but all lay people, I will say. Mere mortals, we'll call them, yes. (laughs) Muggles, right? In in Harry Potter, right? The muggles of architecture? (laughs) Not architects, (laughs) um, but people that are incredibly passionate about this city and incredibly passionate about architecture. And I will say that For other cities looking at this model, it's an interesting model to have highly trained volunteers or non-architects give tours because they are coming from the perspective that architecture is new to them or Mm -hmm. newer to them. And they, in some ways, have an advantage of how to talk to the public because they, not that long ago, were the public enthusiasts, architectural enthusiasts. And I... I think that one of the things that AIA members, and that's, I think, our role also as a chapter, is how do we help our members talk to the public better? Because architects are really good at talking to each other, but they're not especially well-trained to talk to the public. Well, you know, I've read all these magazines that your chapter has kindly been sending me over the years and others from around the country. It seems like architecture, every 10 years, goes through this existential crisis of why don't people understand us? Why don't people like us more? Exactly. And they have a bunch of meetings and committees get together. And ultimately, every single time, their answer is, we must educate the public. Right, right, (laughs) right. And then they do a few workshops and then forget about it and then another decade goes by. Right, right. So what's next? If if Mm -hmm. what's what is going to be new to actually make that connection? Because that's what our organization's all about. That's what we think is important: Mm -hmm. is making architecture more accessible Mm -hmm. to the average person for whom it's their ninth or tenth priority rather than first or second. Exactly right. You know, I spent 18 years at the Chicago Architecture Center, and now being on the other side of that fence, basically the AI chapter side of that fence and thinking about ways of how do we help our members, our architect members, talk to the public. One of the things that architecture centers really know how to do is meet people where they are. And I think the default for architects is often come and look at this amazing building that I have designed and let me tell you how awesome it is. Come to me, come over here come and and let me tell you about this thing I have designed. And that's harder for the public if they don't understand, A, how to look at a building, 
how to engage with a building, or if we're talking about buildings that they maybe don't find as interesting to begin with. And I think a part of our job as the profession that we need to do a better job at is about storytelling, but also meeting the public where they're at. Many cities around the country, either through the Architecture Center or others, have started Open House or Open Doors, Open House Chicago, right. Open Doors Toronto, Open House New York, etc., which provides an interesting way of saying, let's get you in the door to this building that maybe has been locked to you or that you walk past all the time and you're curious about, right? The public is curious about buildings. They are curious about architecture, but architecture can be very opaque uh, for the public. And, and the so, jargon, too. And the jargon. Yeah, lots of arca, arca babble. Ar, arca, <laughs> is that what it's called? Arca babble? Arca babble. Arca speak. Yeah, <laughs> lots, of, lots of that. Right. And, you know, I think that's because even... At the university level, right, we're training young people to talk to a professor, to talk to their peers, but what happens when they're in front of the public, right? Mm -hmm. Think about, one of the questions I talk to our members a a lot about and I challenge them to think about is, when is the last time you had a conversation about architecture with someone who wasn't a client, wasn't a colleague, or wasn't a family member? Are you talking about architecture in your social circles, in your communities, in your groups, at your kids' baseball game? Do you know your alderman or city council person? Do you know your neighborhood block club? Because as that sort of citizen architect, we've got to have those conversations with the public. We can't just have conversations with each other. We've got to really think outward. Can I tell you also about something we're cooking up here in Chicago for the fall? Yes. That's sort of to get at this point. So historically, most chapters have done an awards ceremony where architects meet, they buy a ticket. They, they meet other architects they meet other and they architects, listen to other architects talking to about other their projects. Yeah, I've been talking to these. about their projects. <laughs> they buy a big ticket, dinner, you know, sit down dinner. A, the PA system never works properly. <laughs> right, or <laughs> the people in the back aren't listening anyway because they're just having their own conversation because they're so happy to see each other. Yeah. Right, so it's a net, you know, networking event. And... There's a value in that of celebrating with your people, right? Right. There's value in that, and I don't want to dismiss that at all. But if we're trying to help the public better understand what we do, we need to think and turn that model inside out. And so we made the decision here at AI Chicago this year to move our award ceremony from a big ticket price with a limited capacity to a free public event in the biggest stage in the city, which is Millennium Park. Right, the Pritzker, sure. Pritzker Pavilion. And so we're moving to a model where Peter Sagal from Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me will be the right. host. He's an right. architectural enthusiast. Great. An architecture, self-professed architecture geek. And we are going to hold those awards publicly. So not only can the public come, but the whole entire firm can come, not just the project architects, not just, but everybody. I mean, if you've been working on door schedules as a 25-year-old for the last year and a half on this project, and it wins an award, you want to be there, right? And so we want to think about equity. We want to think about inclusivity. And so we're making a free event. It's a free award ceremony. So the whole chapter can celebrate. But then the public can also participate in that because we're also inaugurating a new People's Choice Award that we are partnering with the Chicago Architecture Center on. So the public will be able to vote also on some favorite projects. Yeah, that's how we do the Matsumoto Prize in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. We have a jury and then we have Mm -hmm. the public voting. Yeah. But by the fact that we're saying we're going to go to the heart of downtown, the people's stage, the great lawn, and we're going to say, come and join us and let's have a conversation about architecture and celebrate what's happening in the city, but also what Chicago architects are doing abroad or globally. We're excited about that. That'll be very successful. I can tell you already. I hope so. It has been for us in doing our awards. Mm -hmm. It makes it so engaging for people to be able to have a fun experience together. Because, you know, architects like fun, but the public likes fun a little more than architects do sometimes. You know, they can be a little restrained. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Thank you so much for spending time with me. This has been very enlightening. Thanks for coming to Chicago. That was George with AIA Chicago's Jen Masongarb. U.S. Modernist has most of AIA Chicago's magazines online, 
along with 30 other city and state chapter publications. To see them, just go to usmodernist.org slash library. Marty Hilton earned degrees in art history and architecture before pursuing a master's in historic preservation at Columbia. After several years working in architecture in New York, he joined the World Monuments Fund to direct recovery of historic properties and communities in the Gulf Coast areas devastated by Hurricane Katrina. Later, as director of the Historic Preservation Program at the University of Florida, he was part of a research team digitally documenting cultural resources at risk due to climate change. And now he works exclusively on mitigating the effects of global warming on our nation's heritage sites as the first architect for climate change at the National Park Service. Floods and fires and torrential rains and snowstorms really don't care whether buildings are historic or not. Here's my conversation with Marty Hilton. So I'm in Palm Springs, and I get invited to this party at this house. It's not by an architectural giant or anything. It's your typical, really cool, small, modernist house in Palm Springs with a pool. I'm invited by my friend Chris French, who's been on the show several times. And I get to meet Marty Hilton. And I find out over the course of cocktails and some well-chosen appetizers that Marty Hilton is sort of intertwined in modernism and preservation in all kinds of interesting and surprising ways. I only knew of him initially through his work with Chris French in documenting a lot of modernist buildings and houses in Florida. But Marty, you were involved with the famous Modernism at Risk exhibit. And so I want to hear how that came about and what was your role in it? Sure. Well, first, I was recruited by the World Monuments Fund, an international nonprofit whose mission is endangered cultural heritage, to be their um, strategic initiatives manager. That means that my job was to really understand trends, both in terms of uh, challenges of preserving certain types of heritage or maybe addressing certain threats. And one of those was the particular challenges of conserving modern architecture. And the World Monuments Fund um, hired me for that purpose. And at the time, they were working rather diligently to save a modernist icon, the A or Anson Conger Goodyear House in Old Westbury, Long Island. This is Edward Durrell Stone? Edward Durrell Stone in his international style phase. Before he lost interest. Before he lost interest. (laughs) Before it was historicist modernism. Yeah. 1938 design, completed construction 1939. Most scholars and others interested in the subject had thought the building lost. Yeah. And it was rediscovered by an architectural historian, Caroline Zaleski. And at the moment that I got involved, uh, they had partnered with the Society, they being World Monuments Fund, the Society of Preservation of Long Island Antiquities, to help save the house. It was one of those classic bulldozer literally in the front yard. A developer had purchased the property, developed neo-neo-Georgian McMansions all around it, and there it, there it sat, basically untouched. I mean, it was like a time capsule. My job was to oversee the restoration and put together an easement to protect the building. The local preservation commission would not list it. It wasn't old enough, they felt. Even if they had, it would only protect the exterior, which was 75% glass. So what you saw was the interior. So it took an easement. It was over 100 pages, room by room, of what could be done and what couldn't be done. And then the real work began was to find an owner who was willing to accept this easement and to take the project on. MoMA was expanding their museum. Anson Conger Goodyear was the first president of the Board of Trustees of MoMA. There was a discussion about could it be purchased as a home for visiting artists and residents. We wanted to make a statement that these types of buildings didn't have to become house museums, if you will, but that could still be lived in and could be updated in a way that was meeting contemporary needs but being sensitive to the architecture. So we eventually found an owner. It's now on the third owner who's done an amazing restoration and adhered to all of the guidelines of the easement. So we took all that knowledge, struggle. There were conservation issues. There were obviously issues of landmarking and sort of policy, if you will. We took everything we learned and we put it into developing Modernism at Risk, which is a program that Knoll, the furniture company, was the founding sponsor. And it included an exhibition, 
the Modernism Prize that's given every year, and grant funding to address technical challenges. So the Modernism at Risk exhibition was also a traveling show. It was. Right? Mm -hmm. Where organizations like ours in North Carolina could request that the truck come and drop off these giant wooden crates that we would try to get into like some sort of Japanese puzzle, <laughs> right? And then we would, and we would stare at them. I was like, okay, well, how do we open this again? And we would pull out all these um, panels, I guess you would call them. Yeah, yeah. And then we had to find something to put the panels on which we didn't quite anticipate. I don't know what we were thinking, if like the, they were going to come like ready to display, and we ended up finding like a whole bunch of easels yeah, and putting them out on display at the AIA North Carolina building. But what was great about this exhibition is it really was like museum in a box. And where did that travel around the country? You know, it was not just the country. It was international. Really? Yeah. Okay. There were definitely over two dozen venues, but maybe close to 30. I lost count. I didn't, none of us really anticipated the interest in the show and the fact that so many like like your organization would request to, to host it. Um, a lot of the focus initially was on universities. Part of the idea behind the exhibition was to engage with young up-and-coming designers, right, in school faculty members, that sort of thing, and instill in them a sort of appreciation of modernism, you know, as they went out and practiced. So, for example, Lund University in Sweden was an international. I actually went to Lund. I have colleagues there, and uh, we did a seminar on conserving modern architecture. Okay. And that was the other great thing about this exhibition was, first of all, many organizations, universities, agencies that took it on would actually add a local story, if you will. So when it was mounted first at the University of Florida, where I was director of historic preservation at the time, and we really focused in on Paul Rudolph's work. Riverview High School was one of the case studies, there were originally five case studies of the exhibition, but we added additional uh, Rudolph work that was unfortunately... It was a Rudolph written. house that was in the exhibition, right? It was the Riverview High School. Okay. That was in, it was his first public commission, right? Sarasota, Florida, 1958 was when it opened. And it would appeared on the World Monuments watch list in 2006. In fact, we had such an inundation of, by the way, the watch list is not unlike the World Wildlife Fund's endangered species list, but for cultural heritage sites. So people could nominate from around the world a site that was significant, threatened, and that they had a plan, mm -hmm. right? They needed outside assistance. So the World Monuments Fund or WMF would step in. We had so many projects that year from the U.S. that I combined them into a serial listing that we called Main Street Modern. And the idea is that every community, I don't care if it's a large city like Chicago where we are or if it's a small town in Florida, every community has a modernist gym. And so Riverview was one. We had a Marcel Breuer library in Michigan. Mm -hmm. and a couple of other sites that were part of the, the Main Street listing. And where is the exhibition now? Do you know? Is it still traveling the world? On in, the, those, in those complicated in those crates? crates? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a good question. It's in storage as far as I know. On occasion, I people will reach out to me, you know, is it still possible? It is as far as I know. Noel is still helping fund that program, and the World Monuments Fund is going strong, so... Who knows? It could, could get revived. You know, it really is great. I mean, our group had no building of our own right. and just some volunteers with some cordless drills <laughs> to try to get into these things. <laughs> well, it was a complicated exhibition, uh, those panels. I think I helped design. Yeah. <laughs> it was involved in those crates, right? Like, it was a massive exhibition, too. I yeah. think there were 40 panels, maybe, Easily. total. Wonderful photographer, Andrew Moore, was chosen working with Noel and was sent to all of these places. So what I appreciated about it was that it was one eye who was photographing all of these places. And then I wrote, I'm not sure if you saw the catalog, Modernism at Risk, the yes. five case study. So I did the research and I was the curator of the exhibition. You know, it was so interesting for a long while, I didn't associate Marty Hilton with Morris Hilton. <laughs> I thought they were like two different people in preservation. <laughs> <laughs> like my alter ego. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's funny. Morris, I'm the third. It's a uh -huh. family name. Yeah. So my mother said she didn't want to call me Morris. And since one side of the family got to name me 
the other side got to choose a nickname. So oh, I see. There I, was some, I go by. I answer to anything, honestly. It was it sounds like a complicated family <laughs> treaty that was worked out for this. <laughs> Absolutely. I do want to say though, Henry Ng was the executive vice president of World Monuments Fund at the time, and it was really Henry's passion for this subject that made it happen. And he was a real mentor and we collaborated really closely on the creation of that program. So anyway, I just want to give him a shout out. Oh, sure. I think he was the one that I talked to. I'm sure he was. In in getting it organized. (laughs) He's a remarkable individual. (laughs) (laughs) Now, when you were in Florida, you did a, a pretty comprehensive inventory, a lot of the number of the modernist buildings down there. I did. It was a statewide inventory working with the Division of Historical Resources or the State Historic Preservation Office in Florida. We received a grant. That's Chris Madrid French, who you noted, and I. We had exactly one year to survey all the modernist buildings in Florida. I'd never done anything quite so uh, extensive. Not sure I will, <laughs> uh, would like to again, but it was remarkable, the methodology. After 10 years in Florida, quite frankly, of the six, near 600 buildings that we initially identified that met the criteria for listing on the National Register of Historic Places under Criterion C for architecture design, I had visited a lot of them. So we had an amazing network of people. We traversed the state from top to bottom. But we really uncovered some significant buildings that were just overlooked. And we also... I think just as importantly as the buildings, we developed, George, 450 bios of architects practicing in that period. So everyone knows Paul Rudolph. If you're familiar with Florida, everyone knows William Morgan or Gene right. Leedy or, you know, they're big names, right? Alfred Browning Parker. They've all had books written about them. But there are a whole nother tier of architects who are working, particularly in the 60s into the 70s, who are just now getting some of the recognition that they deserve. Well, there were certain industries, too, like the banking industry was all about modernism for a while. Absolutely. I mean, every building was going to be futuristic. It was going to be kind of space agey even. It was going to show that the bank had an eye on the future and your prosperity, lots of optimism and hope. And, you know, by the 80s, they weren't doing that anymore. It was... <laughs> Completely conservative, pessimistic banking system. Yeah, no. um, Fabulous, brutalist bank in St. Petersburg that made the list of 600. Actually, I was almost arrested in New Rochelle, New York, as a graduate student for photographing a bank that I thought was extraordinary. I guess you're not allowed to photograph banks. Were Uh, you in the bank? I was actually outside the bank, yeah, but they weren't happy with me. Yeah. Oh, really? They thought you were plotting to... (laughs) Overthrow the bank, perhaps, in some way? I don't know why anyone who would meet me would think I'm a bank robber, but sure. You look really the criminal type, (laughs) Marty. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) But yeah, banks were great. We had six building types or categories, commercial being one of them. Of course, that included banks. And then we narrowed it down. The state asked us, we had a set of criteria. We had an advisory group to 50 that they called the flagship. And the intention was that those buildings would move forward to the National Register of Historic Places. Okay, okay. And quite a few have. So what were some of the unexpected finds that you ran across that maybe weren't on a list, but you kind of ran into them along the way? Yeah. So if you're ever in Cedar Key, Florida, which I'm not sure, it's this tiny little island whose claim to fame, the first train in the late 19th century that traversed Florida from east to west, it went from Fernandina Beach, just north of Jacksonville, yeah, Millie yeah. Island on the east coast, over to the Gulf Coast by Gainesville, Florida, University of Florida eventually, to this little set of islands that actually the German pencil company, Faber, bought property because that's where all the cedar for your number two pencils came from. Huh. That's the that's Cedar Keys. Eberhard Faber, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's a state park, an archaeological site, and there was an architect out of Tallahassee who very few people have known. Now there's research being done on him by some of the parks people in Florida, but he built just this gem of a visitor center for their state park, 1960. His name was Kuhn. I mean, it was like stepping back in time. It was not only that the building was intact, the furniture from 1960 is there. The dioramas 
the original exhibitions all 100% intact, and the building is in remarkable condition. It's made of a, a local modernist material that I've done quite a bit of research on called Ocala Block. Okay. So there's not really proper stone in Florida, right? I mean, we do have Coquina and further south, that sort of limestone that you can find in the Miami area, very soft. But in Ocala, Florida, which is sort of in the middle of the state. Where you, John Travolta lives with that, the 747. Yes, that's Ocala. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> that community, horse farms. I'm uh-huh. from Kentucky. I uh-huh. relate to Ocala. So the limestone there was not durable enough to cut into like the Indiana limestone, for example. But it was being crushed up and used in the construction of I-75 and 95 at the time. And there were a few companies that started manufacturing concrete masonry units, concrete blocks, but they would actually mix it, the Ocala limestone, and it made this beautiful range of colors from kind of yellow to buff. It depended on the bedding layer. And so that part of Florida, just an amazing amount of this beautiful concrete block. And so this building was made out of Ocala block. And this is not the only block you follow. You are Mr. Breeze Block, right? I mean, this is your thing. <laughs> I do. You know, it was actually a student, Christine Zadina. I'll give her a shout out. She and I worked, she did a thesis really looking at Breeze Block. And what's interesting, you know, all these myths evolve about where these trends in mid-century modern architecture come from. Well, going back to Edward Durrell Stone, you know, in his embassy in India, right, that right. had the so widely published. He had, at that point, he was abandoning his international style ways, yes. right? He'd met yes. a second wife on the plane. That's sort of a famous story. And she'd convinced him that, you know, he needed to look at Venetian architecture, yeah. right? Modernism bad, yes. Uh-huh, <laughs> yeah. If you begin to read the scholarship, everyone says it was stone. But the breeze block really came out of Central and South America, that was the tradition. And there were companies in Miami and South Florida, you know, Miami having that strong connection to Central and South America that were doing Breeze Block long before Stone decided to put it on his building. So if you don't know what Breeze Block is, just imagine a cinder block that's got a bunch of holes in it to start out with, and they can be decorative, they can be in different patterns. The idea was is that you could build these to make very light structures that the breeze could flow through. So it could be a screening mechanism for something. It could support certain things, and and some it couldn't because of the load variation. But they were everywhere, really, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And not just in Florida. You know, I recently relocated to Denver, Colorado. I, I pull over all the time because there'll be a great new block design that I haven't seen. That's what's fun is, like, finding those one there's certain ones that are just typical right that you see everywhere but there's some that are fairly unique and they were being manufactured all over the country at one time there's still the a1 block company in orlando florida still family owned have the six of the original forms that they still use and they you can still order uh breeze block well what's so telling marty is that you actually pull over when you see these things. That is a true sign of an enthusiast. <laughs> Way too many images on my phone. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes it's hard for me to get places, right? Yeah, yeah. right. I right. get well, excited. You know, when I was going through Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which I had not expected to be in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, I was in a car full of people driving along, and all of a sudden I saw this concrete, brutalist tower in Sault Ste. Marie, and I basically made them stop the car and let me out. And I don't know where the rest of this group went, (laughs) but I had to see this. And so that's how you get this, you know, modernist fans, we we see something and we got to go see it. Yeah, absolutely. It's an affliction. I'll share one quick story with you that most people don't know. I really just, I don't know why, but started talking about over the last year. But You know, I grew up in eastern Kentucky. I'm a hillbilly. My mother really is a coal miner's daughter. Family's very intertwined with the coal industry. And interestingly enough, my father's, his business is manufactured housing. So I've got this interesting, um, I always said I was the bastard child of architecture, right? Because my father manufactured and sold trailers. But my faculty, when I was in architecture school, said, why is everything Marty designed 14 foot wide and 70 foot long? <laughs> like, it's got to go down a highway, right? Right. Frank Lloyd Wright designed a trailer, actually. I think it imploded down, down the highway. Maybe yeah. it had too many windows or something. Yeah. But my point is, my parents, amazing people, 
still with us, self-made. They took us to Sarasota for a couple of times a year or once a year, I should say, like in February to escape the winters in Kentucky. And it was there that I actually saw innovative modern architecture for, and it just resonated. So for me to be at the University of Florida and to be able to focus research to help create Sarasota Mod Weekend. I, that was my idea. We held a public workshop. I hosted the first national Docomomo symposium there to kind of give back to that community and to work with them. It was a very meaningful moment in my life. I spent at least a decade doing research. You may know more about this, but I remember vaguely that Clayton Homes, which is a big um, Seal. Yeah, yeah. mobile home manufacturer, had something called the iHome about 10, 12 years ago, which was a butterfly roof, yep. mobile home, really gorgeous. Yep. I went to see one at a local lot of these. And what was striking to me at the time is that, you know, we, we took a group out yeah. to see this. And the salespeople were like, who are these folks? <laughs> right? <laughs> They're looking at us and we're taking pictures of it. <laughs> and you could tell that the sales staff at the lot was not so excited about this particular thing. And, and I, I kept wondering, like, why didn't this take off in the manufactured home community of having really great design and the convenience and low expense of a manufactured home? Yeah. It's you a, might know this answer. It's something my father and I, yeah, have had, had discussions about. It's been a while since we've talked about it. But, yeah, it had to do with the economics and it had to do with the audience. I mean, look at, like, look at the amount of prefabrication, right? Like companies, all you have to do is open Dwell Magazine, right? And it's yeah. a new one. And, again, people, architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, I think some of the Bauhaus, international style modernists. But it really had to do with the, the cost. And, yeah. you know, they were really marketing to a group of people who couldn't afford above a certain level. And design does cost a little more, right, or the materials. So Clayton, by the way, was my father's big competitor. In the oh, okay. Place where I was they, were, they were the big enemy, huh? Yeah. But, you know, manufactured housing has everything to do with me being an architect as well. I mean, my father always said, you were the only five-year-old I know could read a floor plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marty, thank you so much for talking with me. It's always a pleasure to, to hang out with you. Yeah, I'm glad. Thank you for inviting me. I feel very honored. That was my conversation with Marty Hilton, recorded at the AIA National Conference in Chicago. Shannon Battison is an architect in Australia's lovely capital, Canberra, and graduated from the University of New South Wales in Sydney. She's not only president of the Australian Institute of Architects, but she's also recognized for leadership with the title FRAIA, which is similar to FAIA in the U.S., She is a passionate supporter of modernist architecture and works vigorously to share Canberra's rich modernist architectural legacy and promising future with the public. Here's George's conversation with Shannon Battison. So, Madam President, I want to ask your opinion on one of the most pressing issues of the day. What is your thought about the recent divorce between Rupert Murdoch and Jerry Hall? (laughs) Because that's big news. It's big, big news. I can't say that's uh, hit my radar yet. I might have to go and look that up. Yes, while you were here at the conference. Oh, really? This is occurring, yes. Wow. There's been lots of uh, other more pressing news, I think, that has taken my news feed. Clearly, I can't believe it. So thank you for talking with me. Of course. Thank you for having me. So I'm a big fan of your nation's capital, Canberra. Um, my own hometown. Yeah because it has this really rich architectural history. It was a design city. And from all the looks of Google Earth, it's really beautiful. It's an amazingly beautiful city, and it has an architectural legacy, really, second to none, you know, designed by Marion Marnie Griffin and Walter Burley Griffin. And when you see the other competition entries, I'm so, so incredibly grateful that their competition entry won because it really was one of the few entries that embraced the natural beauty that there is. And and the Australian landscape is quite different, you know, and, and for the team to have really captured the essence of what is beautiful about it and then embrace it in such a way is is amazing. Of course, like most things, you know, in Australia, we've deviated from the plan, you know, a a fair bit. But the legacy of what they gave us, these incredible view lines through the city, the incredible low form that, you know, really sticks to the topography instead of trying to take it over, all of that is still very much there and makes it for a wonderful city. But of course, we've had two really big periods of development because the building of the city really halted with the war. Okay. 
This was World War II? World War II, that's right. The big war. The big war. And so then the second biggest period of our development was in the mid-century period, which means we have a fantastic collection of incredible mid-century architecture. It's just everywhere. And sometimes it takes outsiders to come and, and remind you of just how amazing these buildings are that you in and out of all day long. You know, in Washington, D.C., our capital, you might have heard of it, we built the reflecting pool and then just kind of stopped. That was our main feature. Yeah. You know, it's like building a house with a tennis court on the roof or something. We just, <laughs> we just were a one-trick pony, really. <laughs> but your capital has all this incredible landscaping and water features and the way the highways and roads build into it. I mean, it's, it's a landscape design amusement park, really. It's an entirely planned city, and the city was planned around the idea of little satellite cities. So we have the main downtown area, although if you've ever seen downtown in Canberra, you'd probably have a chuckle at hearing it called downtown. But so we call it the city centre. And then each area has its Much own. more refined term. I like that. Yes. <laughs> that's right. And Where so, are you going? Oh, I'm going to the city centre. That's right. <laughs> And then you've got these little satellite cities and each have their own little shopping precincts and transport hubs. And so, of course, then you need to connect these spaces. And so that the road network is quite heavily planned and it was a city planned entirely around the car, which gives us some difficulties now, especially as the world changes and we're trying to design out such a heavy reliance on, on cars. But we've just started building a light rail. We have the first stage of a light rail going in, which was having different modes of transport was part of the Griffin's early plan and one that we didn't really kind of take up. So it's nice to see that coming in, albeit in a bit of a different form. So there's room for it, basically. There's room for it. Yes. it it's a very um, spread out city. It's not a big city geographically, but it's one that's been designed to have lots of space between things. And that's something that I think, particularly in my role with the Institute of Architects, I'd spend a lot of time... I'm talking to people about because it's what we're losing in the newer suburbs is we're losing that space in between buildings and I'm sure that's something that's happening the world over but it's something particularly special about Canberra and something we have to really make sure we don't inadvertently lose as we keep growing. We did a whole show on your Capitol building and the TV show Secret City. Oh do you love it? Which was filmed there. Yes. And, you know, I just got to say, your Capitol building is just so lovely yeah. and so symbolic for the nation. You mean the Parliament House yeah. up on the hill? Yeah. It is. It's such a beautiful building. It's it's a wonderful building that until recently, you know, you could walk right up at the grass hill over the top of the building. And, and it really says something about the Australian culture that that building belongs to us as a people and that we really take ownership of that and we enjoy it. And the Australian people are not you know, we, we like to have a bit of a laugh at ourselves. And when they had to put security bollards up so that you can still walk most of the way, but you can't actually go all the way over from the outside, you have to go through security. The biggest protest about it was that our kids can no longer roll down the hill. And, you know, oh, I think yeah. that's very that's quintessentially very, that's, Australian, that that, that was lovely. our heartbreak, that our kids can't roly-poly down the hill anymore because they had to put security up. Yeah. But yeah. it is, it's a fantastic building and it sits very delicately, I think, in the landscape. It's, it's not something that tries to take over. It's incredibly refined and considered. Now, when our intrepid research staff was Googling you, they found a story about a particular scarf. Will you tell us about the scarf? A particular scarf. Oh, my goodness. Yes. My Palm Springs scarf. Yes. Oh, I can't believe you found that story. That's <laughs> embarrassing. Well, look, a couple of years ago, well, a couple of years pre-COVID, um, I came to America to see a friend's house. He had a wonderful house designed in Venice Beach by Sebastian Mariscal. And I had wanted to see this house for a long time. And so I was coming out to see it. And a couple of friends said, look, we really think you'd like this place called Palm Springs. And I was like, I've never heard of it. I'm, you know, I don't know. It's out there in the desert. I don't do heat well. And they talked me into it. And so I went and I loved it so, so much that everyone said, okay, now you have to come back for Modernism Week. And so very next year I came back and I was very, very lucky that a few friends happened to be coming as well. And another friend decided that she would join me on the trip. And we had such a wonderful visit to Palm Springs for Modernism Week. But at our opening night party, we were 
all dressed up in our, you know, 60s gear and, and ready for this party. And I was feeling a bit nervous because it was clothes I don't don't normally wear and I was a long clothes way from no, home. nobody normally wears, <laughs> really, true. to be honest. This, this is true. <laughs> and I was talking to this lovely, lovely man and admiring his scarf that he had in his pocket. And he said, well, sweetheart, this matches your outfit so much better than mine. So here it is. And he gave me this incredibly beautiful Hermes scarf, which will be no doubt the only... Um, and as I can ever, you know, actually own. <laughs> to this day, I have it on my briefcase so that it reminds me that, you know, there's just wonderful people out there, no matter how much difficulty there is in the world and, and, and how much heartbreak there has been, especially over the last few years. There's wonderful people everywhere that you look, and, and that's what I like to hold on to more than anything else. So they always say that the day that you become president of a professional organization is the second happiest day of your life. Uh, the first being when your term of office ends. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that might be true. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how the Australian architectural system is, is organized. Is it patterned after the American system? Is it, is it different? How does it work? Well, I think within the Institute of Architects, there's, there are a lot of similarities with both the American and, and the British system, mm -hmm. I think. So it's a very long degree architecture. And in Australia, we've recently made changes to break it into two degrees so that after all of that time, you do in fact come out with both an undergrad and a master's degree, which I think is, is fitting for, you know, five or six years at, at university. But then even after that study, you know, you're not qualified to use the term architect and the term architect in Australia is legally protected. So you cannot yeah, use as it. As it is here. Yeah. yeah. In most so states. It becomes then, you know, a matter of actually gaining experience in the real world and, and gaining those real details about practicing that are required to, to hold the title. And then you sit for registration and, and finally get to call yourself an architect and not mm -hmm. just a graduate. And the Institute is an organisation that looks after and advocates for the profession. So we advocate for the presence of architects in society and, and the benefit of using professional services and getting our design right, especially in our cities, but everywhere, in our homes, our public buildings, our hospitals, getting the the benefit to all of us as a society of getting the design of the, our built environment right before we start building. And the Institute has a very proud and long history of, of advocating for that across all levels of both public and, and government. I get the impression that in Australia and New Zealand, both, that there is a more of a thoughtfulness about design than maybe we have here in the US, at least in some cities that there's more of a critical thinking, sort of a systemic view of how this affects an area? Or am I just making that up because I love Australia New Zealand? Look, I think um, <laughs> it's funny. I mean, I, I would think that I, I know for a fact that Australia has some of the most incredible architects in the world. But since being here at the conference and actually getting to have conversations and meetings with other architectural bodies from around the world, it's really wonderful to hear that other people actually recognise that Australia is producing some incredibly highly considered architecture. And I think one of the things that I love most about that is that, you know, being such a... I used to say a young country, but we're not a young country. Australia is, has one of, is home to one of the oldest civilizations in the world. But as a, a Western country, we're very young. And so we have a very young profession. And I think that for a long time, we have um, kind of fought for our own identity and tried been trying to work out who we are. And I think there's a lot of architecture where, especially if you look at our early colonial architecture, it's all based on British architecture. Mm -hmm. You know, there's periods where it was emulating, you know, other forms of architecture from around the world. And I think one of the most incredible things that's happened over, say, the last 50 years, definitely from the mid-century period onwards, mm -hmm. is that Australian architects have found their own voice and their own vernacular. And you can really see an Australian identity in the work that's being done. And more recently, I think that as we become more connected to our Indigenous and First Nations culture and to our climate that we're building in, you can really start to see a different vernacular develop around the country. Because, of course, much like America, we're a huge country oh, um, yes. geographically. Huge. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Tiny it's in lots of other immense. ways. Immense, yes. We are huge. 
geographically, which means that, say, Canberra, where I live, it, we have bitterly cold winters, you know, and yet up in the tropics, the, the weather is entirely different. And so it's simply not appropriate to build the same buildings, you know, that you would build in Darwin in Canberra, for example. And it's wonderful to see that we've really started to develop this unique vernacular around the country as well as something that speaks to being Australian. When I talk to American architects, they just can't get over Australia, really. And I wanted to ask you, I've heard about this secret summer camp that Glenn Merkett runs every year where people go and, like, you know, study at the feet of the master. Is, is that a thing it down there? It is a thing. It's a wonderful... I've, I've long wanted to go. I feel like I might have lost my opportunity, but it's a wonderful... Um, I'm trying to remember what they call it now. It's suddenly gone out of my head. But yes, and it's actually not far from me. And they go to a little place on the coast. And it's it's generally not, you know, students of architecture. These are architects in, yeah, in yep. their career. Oh, and, absolutely. And they take an opportunity to learn from a master, which is, I mean, I work have spent a lot of time working with a mentor myself and am deeply grateful for that opportunity to work under somebody who is a master of their craft and to be able to work under some, like, Glenn Merkett and have that experience yeah. is just unforgettable. It, it's kind of like the Hogwarts of, of Australian <laughs> architecture, where you go and learn all the magic spells. It is. Right? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to get that on your list. I know. It's, <laughs> it's on my list. I actually have to see if they've started them up again. I've had a couple of opportunities to meet Glenn recently, and he's incredibly generous and humble and, and, and just what a phenomenal architect. But I was recently doing, I was hosting a conversation for a body called Architects Not Architecture who were who had come out from Europe to host this speaker series. And all questions are supposed to be held at the end. There was a specific section for the questions. And midway through the talk, Glenn, who was sitting in the front row, put his hand up. <laughs> and the organiser looked at me like, no, you can't have to take a question. I was like, I'm really sorry. When Glenn asks a question, you, you take it. <laughs> That's right. When Oprah raises her hand, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't say no. <laughs> in Australia, does the AIA also serve as the regulatory body for architects? No, well, it's quite separate. The AIA is the advocacy group, and we advocate for the profession. Then we have the registration board, who actually carry out that very important role of managing our architectural licensing and registration. And do they do continuing education as well? They, they do. They measure all that for you? They do, okay. yes. And that's uh, much like here, that's probably, uh, it's handled differently in different states. Mm -hmm. But it's a really important part of being in the profession and being, maintaining, you know, your current knowledge. So it's a very important role that is carried out. In most states in the U.S., there's some threshold up to which a person who's not a registered architect can do work. For example, in North Carolina where I'm from, a person can design a house for somebody else without having to be an architect. Is that the same in Australia? It's not, really, and, it, and I think it's something that we would like to see instituted in certain building forms and typologies. It's something, so we're having a big issue at the moment with building quality, particularly in our bigger buildings, in our multi-residential buildings. And I think that what we're coming to recognise is that there is a certain level of experience that should be mandated when you're designing... A hospital, buildings. for example. Absolutely. <laughs> you don't want an amateur That's designing exactly. your operating theatre. But even, um, you know, if you look at multi-residential buildings, what one of the issues that we're having is structural stability over time, uh, ventilation and mould, which can be incredibly damaging to people's health. And what we've got is people who don't have that necessary experience who are actually, in fact charged with designing those buildings and now we're having those issues become quite prevalent and and so this has become a bigger thing and the institute and other bodies within Australia are now advocating very strongly for us setting a minimum standard of experience and what's interesting about that is that it's not even just an architect is required but an architect with a particular type of experience right so right. myself for example who I specialize in climate responsive housing but single residential housing you don't want me designing your um, operating theater that's not an experience set that I have and so we do want to make sure that the appropriately qualified and experienced people are the ones charged with designing those those spaces. Of course. What I'm really talking about is, is in single-family houses because the 80 and 90-year-olds that I interview all the time, yeah. unlike today, we're encouraged in university 
to go design a house for their parents or their parents' friends or somebody and build it in their spare time while they were going to school. And in the 50s and 60s, that was very prevalent in the U.S. Yeah. Our area in Raleigh, North Carolina is dotted with project houses that were designed by architecture students that are still fabulous today. Yeah. And I'm hoping that, that some of that comes back worldwide so people can have a chance to participate just at the house level. I mean, we don't want them designing shopping malls and towers. Well, look, I happen to think our houses are some of the most important buildings we have. In fact, I'm pretty famous for saying they're one of the most sacred buildings that we could ever build, especially in light of what we've asked our houses to support us through over the last few years. Uh, In Australia, my house alone has been asked to protect my family from a bushfire, months and months of the worst, most dangerous air quality in the world, a hailstorm. Oh, right, the big fire. Yeah, the big yes. fire. And then two years of, of pandemic where we asked my little house to be school, workplace, you know, and safe haven all in one. So our houses are, are sacred. But I actually think that they're also this incredible opportunity to be a testing spot and a melting pot of ideas. And so I think they're wonderful things for students to get the chance to do. And I know that my first building under my own firm, you know, 15 years ago now was my parents' house. And I happen to think it stands up pretty well. They're still there. We still spend a lot of time there as a a larger family unit. And it's a wonderful space. But I do see young architects, you know, asked to design for their family and friends. And I think, you know, there's some real experimentation that can happen when you have a client who trusts you in that way. When it becomes a commercial um, venture, venture, then it it becomes a very different trust process, I guess. Now, how does your house feel about locusts? Have you had the locusts come through yet? We haven't had locusts, (laughs) but we have had mice and rats of late. There's a real rat plague in Canberra, which has been delightful. Um, do, you, and now, do you solve rats with cats? I've heard that. <laughs> well, no, because we can't. We, cats are, you know, a really bad thing in Australia. They kill a lot of our wildlife, so oh. our cats aren't allowed outside. Oh, They're really? They're indoor-only cats in Canberra. Okay. So that's been the situation in new suburbs for quite a few years now and now they're bringing in law to say that any cat even in older suburbs if you buy a new cat so if you've had a cat that's obviously always been able to roam it's a bit harsh to suddenly lock it up but any new cat even in the older suburbs will not be allowed out of the house because they kill a lot of our native wildlife so yeah cats are so if I'm a police officer and I pull over a cat how do I tell (laughs) if it has seniority (laughs) How do I know? Now that I cannot <laughs> help you with. But I tell you, the neighbors... Excuse the... me, show me your papers. <laughs> exactly. Are you allowed to be out half dark? <laughs> that's, that, that's pretty interesting. So what do you do about the rats and mice? Look, it's difficult. And, you know, we design houses, and my house in particular, you know, we build design to be very airtight and it's quite a controlled building envelope. And yet the rats still get in there and... You baiting rats is a really dangerous thing. You know they, you know the dead rat can then be eaten by wildlife and and the wildlife die and then can be eaten by people's pets. So it, it's a dangerous thing to do. We set a lot of traps, and there are companies who are I'm sure doing a roaring trade at the moment in Canberra mm-hmm. because we've had such an incredible flood season. Not that the we, water the water the causes water it. seems to be bringing. So because we've had such an incredibly wet summer, we've had this influx of yeah animals that we don't normally you know have so many of. And for Canberra, that's been rats and mice. My last question: How is demolition? in Australia. Are are they tearing down lots of buildings? They are tearing down so many buildings and particularly our 20th century architecture in in Canberra. I've been warned that I'm not allowed to get arrested. I have to step away from the protest at the moment that people might get arrested otherwise I lose my licence. But there's a huge fight on to to slow the, the rate of demolition and I think one of the things that you know we talk about a lot in the, our mid-century, particularly our modernist, you know, preservation groups, is that not all buildings need to be saved, right. but some buildings really need to be, and we need to stop tearing down these buildings that are iconic and really crystalline examples of, of an architect's vision and, and how we can be doing things better. Would that be like the serious building in Sydney? Absolutely. You know, the thought that we would knock that down from both a cultural and architectural and an environmental standpoint. How could you knock down a building that has that much embodied energy in it when it could clearly and has now been refit through adaptive reuse? You know, the fact that 
as a city, we didn't want to protect social housing, public housing in such a, a central location, and we would rather give that to more wealthy people says something about us, but the protest to save that building and to save the community that had existed in that building for so long really say a lot about that people notice this and, and people don't don't want to see these buildings or these communities decimated. You can go online and Google for the serious building in Sydney and see its story. Yes, absolutely. And it, look, it's a spectacular building. I love brutalist architecture. Canberra has a particularly strong brutalist architectural history, which is fantastic for somebody like me. But so I was in Sydney years ago now with a girlfriend and we were shopping for a dress for me to wear to her wedding. And so we were off hunting and she made me walk 10,000 steps before breakfast. My girlfriend is in the Navy and uh, Air Force and we were, she's all about fitness, which I am not. So 10,000 <laughs> steps before I was allowed my morning wow. coffee. Wow. And so as payback, I said, well, then we're walking to my favourite building in Sydney. Yeah. And we got there and I was like, what do you think? And she's like, what am I looking at here? And I said, this is the serious building. And she's like, no, I don't get it. What is that? <laughs> and I said, it is an iconic piece of Australian architecture. And so I get that brutalist architecture can be hard to love for some people, but my right. goodness, it's beautiful. Like car racing and sushi. That's it's not exactly for everybody. It. I, right? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much for talking with me, Shannon. Thank you so much for having me. That was George with Australia's Shannon Battison. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. And by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Guest research by archivist Kelly Policelli, who is a vital part of the intrepid U.S. Modernist Radio staff. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back next week with the last of our Chicago Deep Dish AIA Convention Special Editions of U.S. Modernist Radio. Thank you.